with a lot of uh, doctors, doctors and lawyers. I may have told you this already. I went to school with a lot of doctors and lawyers, and a lot of these guys, you know, they're making lots of money, but they're comparing themselves with each other. And for that reason, the ones that made less money, actually, they didn't do very well. They died young. Yeah, I know. So the point is, you've got to compare yourself with the right people. <laughs> You got to be careful as to who you compare yourself with. We were, we, I talked about this last time. Indians living in the poor province of Kerala uh, have a, have far lower absolute incomes than poor African Americans in the United States. However, people in Kerala outlive African Americans by a substantial degree, and it's because they're comparing themselves with their own people. They're not comparing themselves with African Americans in the United States. They're comparing themselves with other Keralians. And for that reason, of course, they live a lot longer because they are superior to select individuals. And this is one of the reasons why people stay in neighborhoods. They don't want to move out of the neighborhood. Uh, they compare themselves with the Joneses. They compare themselves with the people next door. And of course, they're always competing with these people. And they will always compete with these people. That's the way it is around the United States. And potentially, it's the same way on the reservation. I don't know. You guys have to tell me. I live in Hogan housing, and I don't really compare myself with Kim, what's his name, Losi. Kim Losi is my neighbor, or Marius. I, Marius has a huge house. I mean, it's huge. It's like twice as big as my house back in Iowa. That's not right. He lives in Snowflake. He's not supposed to have a big house. What's going on here, Paul? Oh, you know, I don't know if this thing's aimed in the right direction. Anyway, so we, uh, we select the people that we compare ourselves with. Uh, Robert Bearcloth is, is one of my neighbors. I've got the biggest pile of wood in the whole neighborhood, okay? So you know what that makes me? Richer than everybody in the neighborhood. <laughs> I've got more wood than everybody put together. Yeah. I'm sorry? <laughs> it's Tyron, yeah. He's always talking like that. <laughs> He's just gabbing all the time. Uh, anyway, poor Americans often earn an income that is not that poor by international standards. However, they are poor compared to their fellow Americans and their health uh, suffers accordingly, of course. And this is one of the reasons why poorer people don't, uh, don't live as long as, as people with more money. And the, the question is, uh, and, and what we can do, we can go to Grant, and we can look at all the people in Grant. And what is happening is the poorer people of Grant, they don't live as long as the middle class people in Grant, who don't live nearly as, as long as the rich people in Grant, or the richer people in Grant. I don't know if you've ever been on 40 and going to Albuquerque, but there's that huge mansion right off the road. Right, yeah, in Grant. I don't know who lives there. You know who lives there? Yeah, there was a little murder suicide there a couple years back. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> a murder suicide. Well, it looks like nobody's taking care of the house now, so maybe they. That's the same thing that happened in Utah. My brother, my brother used to live over there. There was like this big mansion on top of the hill. Murder suicide. Murder suicide. Rich people killing each other. I was, it was when I lived there. It was always empty. Oh Grants, really? Grants, yeah. I was living through Milan and Grants. Actually, I lived in Laguna too. Laguna, Milan, and Grants. You lived in Laguna Pueblo over. Yeah. Okay. Wonder if you knew my friend. I wish I could remember his name. <laughs> it was his first name was Jack. Do you know anybody named Jack from Laguna? Okay. His wife was Kiowa. Do you know anybody over there with a Kyle or a wife that's Kyle? The only people I knew were the librarians. <laughs> were the Kiowas? <laughs> and the laundromats. Oh, okay. All right. And the Laguna Burgers. Though. And the Laguna Burgers, of course. This is too fun. <laughs> Disadvantaged minorities around the world tend to be of lower socioeconomic status and they often experience worse health outcomes than those of majority members. So even in, uh, in the United States where you guys have IHS, 
uh, up on the reservation, or no, I'm sorry, did I say reservation? Up on the reserves of Canada, uh, the people that live on the reserves don't live as long, despite the fact they have free health care. Uh, they have better health care than everybody else in Canada. Actually, everybody in Canada has the same health care. And wh wh what, who do they use as their example? Well, this isn't fair. We're, we're white Canadian, we're European Canadians, and by God, the uh, First Nation people, the people on the reserves, uh, they get free health care. That's not fair. I think everybody should have free health care. And that's what they did. They, they have free health care. But they also pay 11% of their income into their health care, national health care. The other problem is uh, getting an appointment. 11%. 11%. Eleven percent. So we pay about that much money in in, uh, in Medicare and Social Security. Well, more than that actually. But they pay eleven percent. But on top of um, on top of Social Security, they have a, they have a Social Security as well. So they pay about a third of their paycheck goes to I know public services. But one of the public services is their own health care. So who can, who can complain about that? So the Canadian's a little bit different from us. In particular, African Americans in the United States suffer from relatively worse health outcomes. Uh, if we look at African Americans in the United States, so where do they get their health care? We know where you guys get your health care. You get it from IHS, and the, despite the fact that it's the crappiest health care in the, in the whole wide world, as people keep telling me, uh, it's still health care, which is better than no health care whatsoever which is what all the other poor people in the United States get, or all the poor people in the United States get. So I don't know if that's fair or not. Is it? Why do you guys get free health care? It's one of your treaty rights. Yeah, you get it by treaty. So the federal government has to give you health care. They don't happen to make a good health care. It's about the same that the military has. As a matter of fact, the pool of doctors that they use is, is exactly the same for IHS and for the military. When they hire somebody, they hire them out of the same pool. So African Americans, and that's one of the reasons why, they, they don't have nearly as much money as everybody else in the United States. Uh, and they uh, don't have any, any health care. They don't, they don't get free health care unless they're Medicaid, and then they get health care. And what would happen... <coughs> If uh, you moved off the reservation, you weren't making very much money, what would happen with you guys? No IHS hospital close by, what would happen? Well, if you made too much money, nothing would happen. <laughs> if you made uh, uh, not very much money at all, then you'd, you'd get Medicaid. That's what would happen. So if you weren't anywhere close to a IHS hospital, then... I'm not sure. Even if you live on the reservation and you make too much money, you still have to buy it. Oh, do they take yeah. away your IHS right? Yep. They do? Really? Yes, they do. My mom always oh, 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 okay. okay. <coughs> you're right, you're right. You're right. But that's Nav Navajo Health Service. Yours is different than everybody else's. It is. So if you were up north and you were native, then you get, you'd have, yeah. All you need is an ID card, a tribal ID card, and you could, you could go into any IHS hospital. But here it's a little bit different. And my wife was trying to explain that to me when we first got here, and I didn't understand what they were talking about, mainly because I wasn't really listening to what she was saying. <laughs> but you guys are telling me that if you, if uh, like uh, Dr. Russell, uh, he probably has to pay, he has to pay, pay for his health service. Okay. Of course, he's also got the same, same health service I've got. Do you have, do you have HMA? Um, I was just laughing. I was, I was, I was just laughing about what you said earlier. You were just saying, so that's how you got I was trouble. listening to my wife. That's how you got trouble the first time. I know. I know. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I've got HMA insurance, and he probably has the same stuff. So I'm guessing he doesn't really have to pay, but he makes a lot more money than I do too. Okay. Well, that's okay. I didn't understand what my wife was talking about. She kept talking about the Navajo Health Service like it was completely separate from IHS, but it, and it is to some extent, but only for people that make more money. This reservation, actually the people on this reservation 
make a lot more money than most of the people on most of the reservations. Uh, most reservations are really isolated, where I like the Fort Belmont. I mean, it's in the middle of nowhere. So there's no jobs. I mean, you have to travel 50, 60 miles to find a job, or to, yeah, to find any work, or to find a hamburger. You know, you, you, you want uh, McDonald's, you, you gotta drive 50 or 60 miles. Uh, people that work uh, in Lodgepole, which is at one end of the, the reservation, they have to drive uh, 60 miles to work and 60 miles home. So it's 120 miles a day. Yeah, that's pretty bad. What? It's like from here to Chaparral. Uh, 60 miles I don't, to Well, they don't have to go over a mountain, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, from here to Chaparral. Uh 60, 70, yeah, about 60, 70 miles, and all, depending on where they live in Haver. Yeah. So to get off the reservation, it takes that long. Or if they live in Harlem, if they live in Harlem, it's still a 30-mile trip to Harlem and 30-mile trip back, so it's 60 miles. Looking at the 15 leading causes of death in the United States, African Americans have higher death rates than that of European Americans for 12 of them. Uh, and what are they? The 15 are uh, uh, the, the uh, leading uh, cause of death in the United States, heart disease, number two is cancer, number three, chronic lower respiratory disease, uh, number four is cardio, uh, cerebrovascular disease, stroke, uh, accident, uh, number five is accidents, number six is Alzheimer's, number seven is diabetes mellitus, uh, number eight is influenza and pneumonia, number nine is nephritis, nephritic uh, syndrome and nephrosis, uh, that all has to do with your kidneys, uh, suicide is number 10. Uh, septicemia, blood infection, is number 11. Uh, number 12, chronic liver disease and cirrhosis. That's usually from drinking. Uh, number 13 is hypertension. Number 14 is Parkinson's disease. And number 15 is assault. Uh, so of the 15, African Americans actually have a higher death rate than, than white Americans or non-African non, uh, Americans in the United States. Uh, anyway, uh, they, they are, are number one as far as suicide, Alzheimer's disease, and respiratory disease is concerned. Infant mortality rates among African Americans are about double that of European Americans, and these differences also hold for those African Americans who are highly educated. Oh, wait a minute, highly educated. Uh, here's the, uh, the uh, infant mortality rate for African Americans. Uh, here's the, here's the uh, infant mortality rate for, for American Indians. So for African Americans it's 17.2 per 100,000 and for, for American Indians, Alaska Natives is 12.6. Well actually that's an, that's an older one. This is, this is the one, 8.6 and 13.2, 7. Uh, not quite half, I guess. So yours is much better than theirs. I guess it's logical though, right? I mean, you have IHS. Most American Indians have IHS. Not all American Indians do, obviously. I mean, oh, uh, less than half of American Indians in the United States uh, live on the reservation, live on reservations. Most of them, so most, most American Indians do not live on reservations. So they don't have access to IHS, unless they live near Phoenix or Tucson or Salt Lake City has an IHS hospital, doesn't it? I think it does. <coughs> you may have ever been to Salt Lake City? I think it does. I think it does. Yeah. Almost all the uh, uh, IHS hospitals are in the east, are in the west. And there are a lot of American Indians that live in the in the e in the east. Uh, New York City has over fifty thousand American Indians. In there. Who would have thought? Why would they go? You have to go. See you later. Okay. Uh, here's white people, uh, 5.7, American Indians 8.6, uh, African Americans 13.7, uh, Asians 14, uh, 4.8, they have the lowest, and Latinos 5.6. Hypertension is especially high among African American men, and unlike other health outcomes, hypertension rates are slightly higher for African American men with college degrees than they are for African American men with less education. Now why in the world would, would educated African-American men have so much trouble? 
What's going on with African American men? Why is it more stressful for them to be highly educated? Would the uh, segregation still be? In their case, it would be. Who are they around? Are they around other African Americans? No. No, they're around, probably around white people. And despite the fact that people might be really, really nice to them, and there's no racism that, they, that they're aware of, they're still not around their own people. <clears throat> now this could be a problem for me, because I'm not around white people either. I'm around you guys, and you guys ain't white. I'm white. You're <laughs> Indian. <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. I was shocked too when I found out. <laughs> so if African Americans have this problem, am I going to have this problem? I mean, if they if they get nervous around people that aren't like them, no. Of course, they have a history of white people have a history of not being nice to to black people to the extent that even if the guy's a good guy, like what happened in Chicago. They still, he's still shooting to death. Yeah, even though he had a vest on that said security, they still <laughs> shot him and killed him. Yeah. Oh, no, this is not good. <clears throat> so that's a problem with African Americans. I told you the story of the 25 guys that uh, I went to college with, and they're all dead. 25 African Americans out of 200 white people or out of 200 people, 25 were, were black. And it was the largest uh, African-American contingent or the uh, uh, freshman uh, class that they had ever had, 25. And there's two of them still are still alive, two of them. And one of them is suffering from schizophrenia. So he's fairly non-functional. <clears throat> Two people alive out of 25. The rest of them just died from all kinds of strange things. Um, the people, uh, there, were, there were individuals uh, uh, in the class ahead of me. They're all dead, African Americans. High blood pressure? Yeah, maybe. But if you, ha if you hang around with white people, uh, there's a lot more stress to your life as, as far as African Americans are, are concerned. The opposite holds true for African-American women and for European uh, men and women. And there you go. So if I had gone to school with African-American women, they'd probably still be alive. But because I went to school with African-American men, it was an all-male school, uh, they're, they're all dead, as sad as that is. And some of them died, I mean, in their 30s and 40s. Why were they, they dying? They were dying of high blood pressure. They were dying of, uh, dying of uh, cardiovascular disease. They died in automobile accidents. One of them was murdered. Uh, back in 1969, I set, a, I set a record. I know. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I set a record in 1969. And uh, it was a sprinter's record. I mean, it was a sprint relay is what it was. And uh, one of the guys is black, and he's, he died. I didn't realize he died in his 50s, but I ran with him. He, he, he was a leadoff guy, I was number two. And he handed me the baton, and he always ran right up my butt because he was so much faster than I was. So <laughs> he'd start handing me the baton before he got anywhere close to me. And then by the time, then he'd stop as soon as I grabbed all of the body and stop so he would run me down. Or, or, he was a lot faster than I was. <laughs> but he was only the second fastest guy on the team. The guy that was the anchor was the fastest guy. Compared to, to European Americans, Latinos uh, tend to have lower mortality rates for 10 of the 15 leading causes of death. Um, this ethnic difference is all, is all the more puzzling because Latinos tend to, to be of lower socioeconomic status than, than the European Americans and hence should be expected to suffer worse health outcomes. And this is known as the epidemiological paradox. Now what is it about Latinos? Why is it 
that people who speak Spanish should be in better health than, than a European Americans. Simpatico. Simpatico. See, si. they're so simpatico. Everything. They're so relaxed. They're so nice to their families. I guess. Is that going to make them live longer? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's the weirdest thing in the world. I used to joke that I would, uh, if, if I could, uh, I'd like to be a Hispanic female because they live longer than anybody else. Do I look Hispanic? How about the female part? Mm. I got neither one. What do I? <laughs> uh, I think that's S-O-L. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. The epidemi epidemiological paradox does not apply equally to, to all uh, groups of Latinos. Puerto Ricans do not uh, show some of the same unexplained health benefits as Mexicans, and there are no explanations as to why. Now, what's going on with Mexicans? And if they live so damn long, why in the world won't uh, uh, Trump let them in the country? Wait a minute. The people that are trying to get in the country right now are from Central America, not from Mexico. <clears throat> what's... What's going on with these guys? Why, why do they get to live so long? The Mexicans, I mean. And what's the difference between a Mexican and a Puerto Rican? When I was in the service, I had lots of Puerto Rican friends. I had lots of Mexican friends. And I'll tell you what, don't ever get them mixed up. Because you get punched right in the nose. <clears throat> That's why my face is so messed up. <laughs> 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 Don't ever call Puerto Rican a Mexican. My God, <laughs> they'll they'll punch you right in the right in the schnoz. As funny as that, it's not funny when it happens, of course. <laughs> What's the difference between Puerto Ricans? Do, are, so genetically, are they that much different? Puerto Ricans are are just like European Americans. They've got a life expectancy that's almost exactly the same. But not Mexicans. So what's the difference between people from Puerto Rico and people from Mexico? They were colonized? They were both colonized. Oh, okay. um, the Puerto Ricans consider themselves Spanish, which just confuses me to no end. I mean, they they look just, I mean, they look alike. They look alike. You can't tell them apart. That's the problem. You can't look at somebody and tell that they're Puerto Rican unless they've got that little flag somewhere. Okay. <laughs> I know. So you got to be really, really careful. And I learned it didn't take me more than a couple punches in the face before I learned not to even pretend that I, I, I thought that this person was from Mexico or from Puerto Rico, either one. I just went, hey, Mr. Rodriguez, how you doing? Mr. Ramirez, Mr. Lopez. Sergeant Lopez, you look, <laughs> you're looking well today. <laughs> the fact that you're only this tall, that doesn't mean. <clears throat> Genetically, who are the Mexicans more like? Are they more like the Spanish? Or who are they like? Why are they so dark complexioned? Which is the right way to pronounce that word. Complexion, not complected. Who are they like? They're like you guys. Yeah, they have a lot of native ancestry. In Mexico, not so much in, in uh, Puerto Rico. What happened in Puerto Rico was that they killed off the whole native population, tried to turn them into slaves, and it didn't work very well. They got sick and they died. So there's not that many... There's, so the, the people from Puerto Rico, the people from uh, Puerto Rico are primarily Spanish. So they really are of Spanish descent more of Spanish descent than people from Mexico. People from Mexico have more native ancestry. Some of them are probably pure. Uh, Dr. Lerma, potentially, he claims that he's, he's, uh, his ancestors came from, from Mexico. But they're native. I mean, they're, they're almost pure native. Especially in select portions of, of Mexico, uh, the, the south central portion. Uh, the Chiapas re region is uh, primarily, they're all, they're, they, very little Spanish uh, uh, mixture there. But if you look at somebody from, 
from Puerto Rico, this is what they look like. They look like me. Well, not exactly like me, but she's also from Puerto Rico. Well, this is confusing. And so is this guy, and so is this guy. They're all Puerto Ricans. But you can see this guy looks white, and these people don't especially look not like him anyway. So where did they get all this dark complexion? Well, potentially they are of the Taino. Tainos are the people who live on Puerto Rico, or lived on Puerto Rico. They still do, of course. But there, there is some of that in, in their ancestry as well. Uh, who's, who do we know from Puerto Rico? Besides J-Lo. J-Lo's from Puerto Rico. She's Puerto Rican. I know, she keeps playing Italians. That's really weird in the movies. She's Italian. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Latinos tend to be less likely to drink and smoke than non-Latinos, although they also tend to exercise less. Uh, I, I play ball with a lot of these guys. They're real good ball players. They tend to be good ball players. Um, the longer they have uh, lived in the United States, the more likely they are to engage in unhealthy behaviors as they come to drink more, smoke more, and are more likely to become obese like this guy. He's kind of big. He's kind of big and he's eating a really big piece of pizza. That's uh, Chicago deep dish pizza that he's eating there. Probably should drink, drink water and, and not eat that big piece of pizza. He'd be better off. Uh, some of the cultural factors are more pronounced among Latinos, such as the high value placed on childbearing and a good deal of emotional support provided by the community seem to provide an important health buffer. I think I told you the story about when I was playing on the Mexican ball team. The wives were always trying to find me a wife, which was <laughs> kind of funny. <laughs> and hey, I'm easy. I, I would. <laughs> Had not gone with anybody, but they couldn't find anybody that they thought they were all, and they did a great job of taking care of my kids. My kids started speaking Spanish. I mean, they're just little bitty guys. They had no clue what was going on. And of course, they played a lot of games, and and they were playing whatever whatever games the, the uh, Mexican kids were, were playing. But uh, these ladies were always trying to find me a wife. Uh, and this is what would happen. They would say, "Oh." Um, my God, I have a cousin. She's coming up from you know, Guadalajara next week. Uh, you want to go out with her? And then her brother, or the, uh, the guy, the lady's husband, would come, come up to me and say, oh, you don't want to have anything to do with her. Lupe, she's, she's a crazy woman. I don't know why he, she wants you to date her. Don't do it. I mean, it was one of those kind of deals. And then somebody, the third baseman, would come over and say, Lupe. Is it Lupe they are what they want to fix you up with? Don't don't have anything to do with Lupe. She's wild. She'll she'll but well I will tell you what the rest of what what the rest of it was. Anyway. Latinos uh, derive health benefits from cultural scripts such as simpatica and their unusually high levels of positive effect. This shirt I, I thought this was kind of interesting. This shirt says uh, uh, I am I am brave. I'm nice, and I'm intelligent. Uh, so I don't have to be tall. That's what it says. I don't have to be tall. <laughs> uh, kind of cool. In traditional non-Western societies, beliefs in supernatural causes of illness are widespread. Uh, these range from theories that aggressive spirits, such as ghosts, uh, cause disease, uh, which is the most widespread theory of disease that uh, ghosts do, do it. They're the ones that make you sick. Uh, to, account of, uh, to accounts of witchcraft, sorcery, mystical retributions, and sinful violations of taboos. This is very common. Uh, so if you know of, of other groups uh, that uh, uh, claim that disease has to do with the fact that it's a ghost disease or whatever, or that somebody has cursed me, uh, or that uh, they're seeking retribution against me, this is very common in uh, non-Western societies. Among the Azande of uh, West Africa, the primary cause of illness is attributed to witchcraft. Now, I want you to look at this lady's eyes. She's a Zande. Look at her eyes. <clears throat> Some Zande are believed to be witches, and the source of their witchcraft is believed to be a small organ in their bodies. 
uh, which can be inherited from their parents. So look at her eyes. Wait a second, I got another one. Here's another Zonde. Look at her eyes. Look at her eyes. <laughs> uh, the Zonde witches do not perform any rites. Uh, they don't use any potions or cast any spells. Rather, witches conduct their witchcraft uh, entirely through their minds. Do all of you feel sick yet? No, not yet? Okay. <laughs> Look at her. <laughs> Trying to hypnotize you with your eyes. When a Zande develops a slowly progressing illness, it is believed to be uh, the result of a witch uh, who is consuming the soul of its victim's organs a little bit at a time. So usually when you do get sick, like cancer, uh, the idea is that you got your cancer from a witch. Uh, when a Zande develops a sudden acute illness, it is believed uh, to be the result of a sorcerer casting a spell on them. Uh, I was cursed uh, when I left uh, Fort Belknap. Have I told you this? I was, I was cursed when I left Fort Belknap. Okay. Joe knows about this. Uh, but up there, if uh, you know, they, they believe in that kind of stuff, uh, but up there, if somebody curses you, they have to take what happens to you twofold. So in order to hurt somebody, you have to hurt yourself twice as bad. I know, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to me, but I mean, if you really want to hurt somebody, you'll do it, right? If you're really that pissed off at somebody, you'll go ahead and do it. Well, the lady that uh, theoretically cursed me, uh, I, I had a heart attack right after they fired me, but she came down with cancer, so she had to have, she had to have surgery. I didn't have to, well, I did have surgery. It fixed my heart. But uh, she, she came down with cancer, so. Ha, ha, ha. She's got a big scar, and I got no scar whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the last time I had, uh, they looked at my heart, they said, uh, no damage. I can't see that you've had a heart attack. And I said, well, you know I've had a heart attack. You fixed my heart twice. He said, oh, well, I can't find any scar tissue. There's no scar tissue in there. There's no, nothing's dead, you know. He acted kind of pissed off. You know how doctors are. <laughs> they want you, if you're sick, they want you to act sick, okay? So he wanted something to be, be wrong with me. And there was nothing wrong with me, unfortunately. In traditional Chinese medicine, a, a healthy body is one in which the dialectical forces of yin and yang are in balance. Does that sound familiar? Yin and yang, balance, the funny looking circle. Uh, any imbalances are believed to be ultimate, will ultimately lead to illness if you have a difference between your yin and your yang. Yin and yang, there are lots of definitions of yin and yang. One's male, one's female. Uh, one's hot, one's cold. One's day, one is night. This one's night and this one's day. Uh, so yin and yang are really kind of, kind of curious. That, of course, that's Asian uh, philosophy. A person who has a liver fire will have symptoms such as headaches, flushed face, and anger, and this illness is believed to be caused by having too much yang and not enough yin. Wait a minute, which one was yang? Yang was day, so you had too much day and not enough night, as it were. So you've got, you've got brain fever, you've got uh, uh, liver fire. <clears throat> uh, so you're angry, too much day, too much heat, you get it? Okay. Uh, such an imbalance can be corrected by acupuncture, herbal remedies, exercise, diet, and lifestyle. You need to bring yourself back into balance. This is uh, what they, feng shui. You need to balance your house. You need to hire somebody to come into your house to put everything in balance, to make it balanced. Um, <laughs> Marius the other day. The other day, he's putting, he's putting together his office, and he, he keeps calling me in and says, does this look okay over here? Is the, does this look the balance? Is this okay? <laughs> he thought I was Chinese, and I do that whole fun short thing. And I teased him about it. Of course, I tease him all the time. I said, yeah, that's pretty feng shui, dude. That looks pretty good to me. So I go into Marius' uh, office to see if it's, you know, balanced, if there's any feng shui going on. It actually looks pretty good. I was impressed. Actually, he did it all himself, and every time he, he'd ask me about something, I'd go, yeah, yeah, it looks good. You know, I'm not even looking. 
with one of those kind of deals. There's something wrong with that guy, I swear. You know, I think his problem is he lives in Snowflake. <laughs> Have you ever been to Snowflake? You're like, you're driving through the desert, you just pass through the petrified forest. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, there's not even any bushes. And then all of a sudden you come you over a hill and you come down into Snowflake and it looks like Iowa. Yeah, it looks like Ireland. <laughs> what the hell's going on there? He lives in an emerald power of paradise. Uh, have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. It's weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then you go to Sholo, and it's kind of the same thing. I mean it's like irrigated or something. So he has to drive through the desert to get to work. And he has to drive through the desert to get home. Poor guy. Emerald paradise. Western doctors often disagree with one another. Uh, there are rather striking differences between medical practices of, of French doctors and American doctors. Uh, the, a lot of people don't like the French in the United States. I'm not exactly sure why. I had a good friend that uh, hated the French, just hated the French. But he was a soldier, and I couldn't figure this out. Well, the French kicked, they, they left NATO in 1969, and they kicked us out of France. Uh, no more NATO bases in France. Um, and I think that's why he disliked the French. A little bizarre. <clears throat> why in the world would you dislike the French? We also had to go into Vietnam. Vietnam was controlled by the French until 1954. Uh, and after the French pulled out, then all of a sudden we, had, we started having problems with, uh, with the Vietnamese. And then we had to go in later on. And of course the French told us not to do it, and we did it anyway. Uh, when we went into uh, Iraq, when we invaded Iraq, not the first Gulf War, but the second Gulf War, the French wouldn't come with us. The Brits did, the Australians did, the Germans did, but the French wouldn't come with us. And if you were alive at that time when we invaded Iraq, 2001, 2003, uh, instead of having French fries, a lot of people got, were so pissed off at the French that uh, they changed the name of French fries. They changed the name of food, okay? They changed it to freedom fries instead of French fries. <laughs> as stupid as that is. I almost got in a fist fight up in Montana because I ordered French dressing. Oh, you don't love French dressing, that's Catalina. It's orange dressing, I don't know. No, it's French. It's French dressing. I like French dressing. Oh, you can't like French dressing. Well, there's something wrong with those French guys. Those frogs. He called them frogs. Uh, French believe in a concept of terrain or balance. Uh, this emphasis on, on balance shifts drug consumption away from antibi antibiotics and toward various tonics and vitamins that are believed to strengthen the immune system. So instead of throwing pills at you that change your your biome, the, the, the bacteria in your body, they give you vitamins and tonics trying to build up your immune system, which is very logical. Long rests and spa visits are also viewed as an important part of lifestyle that rejuvenates the terrain or balance. So you guys believe in balance as well, right? Bojo, well, that, however you pronounce that. Of course, I didn't pronounce it correctly, but you believe in that. So do the French. They believe in balance or terrain. Now the funny thing is, I don't know if you guys use clowns as much as they do, but they do in France. And so somebody will come to your, I don't know if you've ever been in the hospital, but I don't, re, I don't know if you've ever seen a clown at the hospital. Probably not. We, are, we have American doctors. They don't believe in humor. If you've ever been around doctors, they're not very funny at all, even a little bit. No, no sense of humor whatsoever. Bedside manner, eh, probably not the best. But in France, of course, this is part of the, the these people work for the, uh, for the hospital. And they come to people's rooms, they tell them jokes, they do silly things uh, to try to make them feel better. I mean, there's nothing more boring than being in the hospital. <clears throat> the nurses are always taking your temperature and giving you medicine and kind of grump, grumpy, grumpy and growly uh, at you. And, Whatnot, but in Some France, these don't work <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but in France, of course, they don't do that. They have 
they bring clowns around. And of course, they also think Jerry Lewis is funny in France. I haven't figured that one out either. <laughs> Hospital stays are relatively long in France. They're about twice as long as they are in the United States. Uh, and, they, uh, and the idea is that you need to recuperate. And they're very, they have a lot of light. Uh, most of the rooms are private rooms. Uh, they also have double rooms where you become friends with the guy that uh, is in the bed next to you. Uh, so that's the way they do it in France, and that's not the way we do it in the United States. When Europeans first came to the Americas, uh, the natives often uh, commented on how badly they smelled. The Europeans stunk. They thought we stunk. You guys thought we stunk. And if you've ever been in a sweat with a white guy, then, prob then you were right, probably right. We do have more body odor than you guys do. I used to sweat up north, and buy, they hated when I came to a sweat. They hated it. They said, my God, you guys smell like onions. What's, what's wrong with you? You eat too many, too many onions. You smell like onions. Or I played, I, and I played on a, 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 a softball team, team up there for like seven years. And, uh, we, you know, we'd be playing ball, and we'd be, it, it'd be like 110 degrees. And we're just playing ball, and I'm sweating like a pig. And these guys, they don't have the first drop of sweat. No odor whatsoever. Here I am just speaking the place off. They couldn't stand to be. I had to, I had to coach third base, okay? I had to coach third base. They wouldn't let me in the... Okay. It's tragic. Or maybe I volunteered. I did say I volunteered to coach third base, okay? They weren't throwing me out. They thought it was funny. Anyway, they thought we smelled. And the people that they thought smelled the worst were the French. Not the English, not the Spanish, but the French. Uh, this was because uh, the common practice in the 17th century in France uh, stated that bodily secretions offered a layer of protection, so it was considered unhealthy to bathe frequently. So these people would bathe three or four times a year. Every three months is, is soon enough. So did they do the same thing in France today? In 1976, an uh, article in Le Monde, which is the uh, national magazine of France, uh, stated that fr in uh, French hospital, a French hospital patient had the right to a monthly bath and a weekly foot washing. You think I'm kidding. They bathe once a month. When I lived in Germany, uh, I... I took the bus a couple times, you never wanted to be on the bus on Fridays. Because these guys had worked all week, these factory workers had worked all week, and they had had a bath yet. Friday night was the night they had a bath. They always took a bath on Friday night or Saturday night. They took a bath, if they went to church, they'd take a bath on Saturday night, but if they didn't take a bath, they didn't go to church, they took a bath on Friday night. Why, Why on Friday night? Because they always went out on Friday. Through the week, oh my God, the smell, you wouldn't believe it. They could knock your socks off. <clears throat> You'd have to get in the back of the bus. Trying to stay away from all the factory workers. Ugh. French dermatologists recommend that people, even those with oily hair, not wash their hair more than once a week. That's enough. Because doing so causes a greater amount of oil to be secreted. So the more you wash your hair, the more oil it secretes. Yeah, but at least it looks clean. My wife and I have been complaining about uh, uh, watching television shows where the women look like they haven't washed their hair for a month. They have oily hair. It just makes you want to vomit. Well, it makes me want to vomit. <coughs> I wash my hair every damn day, and it's really oily because I know, but it looks okay. Here's a naked woman, not really. <laughs> She's got parts missing, okay? <laughs> the metaphor used in the United States by doctors that, uh, is that the body is like a machine that needs to be tended to regular, regularly to ensure that it is running well. It's like a machine. Uh, when there are problems with the body, it is often treated in ways that you might expect to see a machine repair. It's like fixing a car. You need your carburetor, you've got a bad carburetor, you put in a new one. Just put in a new one. That's what my wife did. She's got bad hips. Her ball joints are, are off. Her universal joints are off. 
just pull them out and put in new ones. That's what they did with my wife this summer. They yanked her 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 uh, hip joints out and and stuck in uh, Teflon and ceramic hip joints. So now she has Teflon and of course I haven't seen her. I saw her for two days in October. Uh, so, but I'll get to see her at Thanksgiving. We'll see how she's doing. She's got scars on her hips. Where they, you know, chopped out the old ones and stuck in the new ones. <laughs> kind of like pop beads, you know. <laughs> you just pop them apart. <laughs> United States medicine is known as the most aggressive in the world. Surgical procedures are used far more in the United States than in other countries where ma malfunctioning parts are removed, replaced, and or physically altered. And we do that a lot in the United States. Uh, we had waited for years. She, she's had bad hips for two or three years. But it was time. Uh, we, and we did everything that we could not to have to replace her hips. But of course, eventually we did have to do that. Some people, they'll just do it automatically right away. Doctors want to do surgery like tomorrow afternoon. So once she decided that she wanted surgery, they got her in like the next week. She agreed to the surgery on one week, and the next Tuesday she had surgery and had her hips replaced. They were ready to go. They had just pop out the old ones and yank, in, yank out the old ones and pop in the new ones. And that's what they did. United States doctors are more likely than European doctor, doctors to use surgery rather than drugs. Uh, but when drugs are prescribed in the United States, they are prescribed at higher dosage, dosages than any other country. We, and that's the reason we have an op opioid epidemic right now, is because if you, if you have a pain, they will give you enough drugs for three or four weeks. Even if a week is enough, they'll still give you more than you need. And that's the reason that we have an epidemic. It is rare in the United States for a doctor to prescribe rest and relaxation as a curative agent, but of course in France it's very common. U.S. doctors tend to search for an external cause of illness such as bacteria and viruses. United States doctors prescribe more antibi antibiotics than doctors from elsewhere, and Americans tend to have a greater concern for cleanliness and attempt to avoid contact with germs. You need contact with germs. They give you immunity. They help your immunity. The worst thing you can do for your kid is, is raise them in a, uh, in a sterile environment. It'll kill them. They'll be sick the rest of their lives. They won't be immune to anything. Let them live in the dirt. It's good for them. Don't worry about it. Don't use antibacterial salt soap. The bacteria on your hands actually protects you. And that's okay. That's good. These, these are good bacteria. It's not bacteria that, that's going to kill you. You want to kill off the staph. You need to kill off the uh, E. coli. You need to kill off uh, beta strep group A, Klebsiella. You need to kill off uh, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculi, the one that causes tuberculosis. Those are the ones you need to kill off, but they're not all over the case. You, want to, you, don't, you want to stay away from gonorrhea. Of course you want to stay away from gonorrhea. Everybody wants to stay, off, stay away from gonorrhea. Fall is gonorrhea season. That's what I, I know. On the Navajo Nation, STIs, um, the rates rise in the winter times. Yeah, gonorrhea. You know. We're trying to stay warm. <laughs> trying to stay warm. I found it. Ah, yeah, that's right. You're trying to stay warm. Uh, it's that way all over the all over the United States. Winter time. Well, I mean, you know, indoor indoor games. Yeah, indoor. <laughs> what are you gonna do next? Uh, not outdoor games. Okay. Anyway, fun stuff. <clears throat> Last chapter. You know, we may finish and, and not have to uh, talk to each other like. <laughs> I know, that's what I was thinking too. <laughs> the last week. <laughs> mental health. Let's talk about mental health all over the world. This is one of my favorite chapters. We get to talk about all the other crazy stuff that happens all over the world, not just in the United States. The DSM-5 is the one thing, but 
there are other insanities uh, from other places in the world. Psychological disorders are defined as rare behaviors that somehow impair the individual. The problem, uh, what type of impairment is problematic, and what if a behavior that is rare in one context is not rare in another context? And of course we could uh, use PTSD as an example. We could use combat as an example. Uh, so what's going on in combat? Uh, well, it's a very stressful situation. Normally you wouldn't kill anybody. But of course if you're in combat, that's what you're supposed to do. Normally you don't pick up a gun and shoot somebody, hopefully. Not, well, some people do, but not that often. Uh, but of course, in, uh, in a combat situation, that's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to handle it without getting excited. Now what if we had a guy that picked up a gun and went into a bar and started shooting the place up, killing people, and he didn't get excited? Would we think there was something wrong with him? <coughs> However, if you're in combat, with exactly the same rifle, damn it, they have too many AR-15s out there, exactly the same rifle, if he's in combat, he's got that AR, it's not, yeah, well it is an AR-15 now, they're not using M-16s anymore. Uh, he's, he's got an M, what is it, M4? Is it an M4? Do you know? No? No? Okay. I can't remember what they're calling military rifle now. M6. Is it an M6? I I don't know either. I've heard that before. The M9 is a pistol. Is oh, the okay. yeah, military something. Anyway, okay. So uh, if you're if you're in a combat or if if you're in a, a, a bar and you pick up a, an AR-15 and start shooting people and are shooting people without getting excited, screaming anything, uh, you know, you're doing it uh, uh, cold and uh, calculated. Uh, what will happen? What will they think of you? If you're shooting, if you're shooting people in a cold and calculated manner, will they think that you're sane? Mm -hmm. Is that More insane? Abilities. Is that insane? Yes, it's insane. It, it is. Well, what if you're a soldier and you do exactly the same thing? You go wandering into a, a, a village and people start shooting at you, and you go into the first room and here's all these guys with AK-47s, and you just pop them, shoot them one by one. Killing each and every one of them, hopefully, or wounding them badly enough that they. Kind of how like that saying goes: if you kill a few, they call you a killer. If you kill them all, they call you a conqueror. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm a good soldier. I go into that room and I kill everybody, and I go to the next room. By golly, and I don't get excited because I got a, I've got a job to do. So I go into the next room and I shoot everybody in that room with an AK-47, of course. I don't try not to shoot the civilians that are standing there. I, but I've done it in a cold and calculating way. Do I feel any remorse? Probably not. But the other guy that went into the bar with this, exactly the same rifle that I had and killed all of those people in the bar and did it in a cold and calculating way, we think he's mentally ill, don't we? But we want our soldiers to be like that, but we don't want them to go into bars and do that. That's what happened with that Marine in uh, Ventura, California. He went in and methodically he was shooting everybody. <clears throat> uh, I read something about uh, the people that he shot. Most of the people that he shot, he shot more than once. So he was, he was doing kill shots. A kill shot is two shots to the chest, one to the head. And that's what he did. He was shooting shooting them twice in the chest, and then the coup de grace was the shot in the head. And he did this with almost everybody. There were only two people. He killed 12, and 10 of them were shot that way. Two of them were shot just once, and he killed them. But uh, all the rest of them, uh, the other 10, he executed. Did it just the, the way you're supposed to do it? Oh, well, I mean, he was trained to do it that way. Is he crazy? He wasn't mentally ill when he did that in Iraq, but he was mentally ill when he did it in Ventura, California, in the bar. <sighs> Indeed, some psychopathologies are more prevalent or manifest in highly different forms across cultures. So this is our culture, and, and this is acceptable behavior. 
Are there people upset that the guy went into the uh, uh, synagogue in, in Pittsburgh and killed 11 older people? Is it worse that they were older people? If they had been people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, would that have been better? Is it worse that they were, nobody was under the age of 64. They were between 64 and 97. So how do you feel about that? You honor your elders, white people don't in the United States, but you guys honor your elders. It doesn't piss you off more that he was shooting old people? Well, that's Travis. Should it bother you more? Would it have been better? I mean, the guy that shot the 12 people in, uh, in Ventura, those were all kids. Most of them were in their 20s and 30s. Was that better than shooting people between the age, the age, 11 people between the age of 64 and 97 in Pittsburgh? Was that worse? Which one was worse? The kids. The kids? They had a they had longer to live. Mm -hmm. I got them right there. Death is yeah. Yeah. probably would have died in a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Depending on the health problems. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If they were if they were in the synagogue pr God praying, perhaps they had diseases that, that they were praying to, to take care of. But the old the uh, young kids were there for a good time. Mm -hmm. I think they were, were were they did they have a conga line going when he went in there? Or something like that. They had a, I know. And he just started shooting people. Yeah. So that's worse. The, the young kids is worse than the old people. Okay. So we can kill old people, and that's all right. No. <laughs> it's not all right. <laughs> oh, okay. This is kind of exciting, isn't it? <laughs> uh, experiencing a cultural bound syndrome generally requires one to have cultural beliefs associated with the syndrome. Uh, so if you guys go up north and you go into a sweat and they had the four rounds and the fourth round they or five rounds I'm sorry uh, and the fourth round uh, they pray to Bigfoot you guys have Bigfoot down here right do you pray to Bigfoot okay. is he a good guy or a bad guy or he's a, he's a protector of the mountains <sighs> it's he's, a, he's a protector up there yeah. too but he doesn't just protect the mountains he protects people who are vulnerable. <coughs> so he comes down out of the mountains to uh, protect children or to protect weak people. That's, that's his job. Okay. That was up north. I don't know if that's the same thing down here. Okay. Well, it's just, just a different place with different ideas. Same, same guy, different mountains, but okay. Does the same job. He mm -hmm. does exactly. It's kind of interesting. And he does exactly the same thing. <clears throat> so if you believe it, he was one suit for. Oh, yeah. he's he's coming from the suit people. Oh, really? Who believe that he's a suit? Oh God, a suit God. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really tall people too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they don't have really big feet though. They have these little bitty tiny feet. So, <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I'm 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 getting dressed and there's this <laughs> there's this black feet guy sitting over there. And he's like he's a basketball star, six foot. <coughs> and this guy's got like size, I don't know. He's got these little tiny feet and I'm thinking, how the hell do you walk around with those little bitty nubs? It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I asked him, Well how, how big are your shoes? And he said, They're tens. And I'm thinking, I wear a twelve. And I'm five foot six, and he's six foot eight, and he wears a ten. So they don't have big feet up there. That was my point. Their big foot is not is obviously not suited. Like a whole many shoes. Okay. And I think it's because they rode horses so much. I don't know. They didn't have to walk around very much. Maybe I did. I had to walk around too much. Okay, we're going to talk about some cultural syndromes here. Uh, some of these have to do with sex, so I, apolo I apologize, but this is just the way it is around the world. People are worried about sex. Uh, one of the things that you'll learn in counseling psychology, if I teach you correctly, is that that's probably the number one cause of problems. 
with people. When husbands and wives are having problems, it, number one, actually the number one cause is money. The number two cause ha it has to do with their sexual relations. So you're going to get to talk about this a lot. I'm sorry. I tried to get uh, Travis to say the word ejaculate the other day. It took like five times before I could get him to actually say it. He was counseling my character and my character didn't have that problem, but other people had that problem. Okay. As strange as that. Uh, dot is a, this is from India. It's a uh, morbid anxiety seen most frequently among South Asian males uh, that they are losing or leaking semen. Uh, and it, it is believed that loss of sperm results in the person getting seriously ill. They think that the, you only have a select amount of semen in your life, and is, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, keep it and don't lose it, then you'll be healthy. But if you lose too much of it, like people who masturbate, potentially, they lose too much of it, then they will get sick. And this is known as DOT. This often results from anxieties and disapproved sex acts, such as masturbation. Uh, it's been there for a long time. It was there before Christianity got there. I know Christianity talks about masturbation, or they tell you not to do it. Uh, but in India, of course, this is a problem that they've had for an extended long length of time. Uh, this dot would be meaningless label in the United States, uh, however, uh, where there are no cultural beliefs about the vitality that sperm endows and no cultural beliefs about the consequences of loss of sperm. Now remember, we talked about that one tribe in New Guinea who uh, the uh, young men have oral sex with the older men to get their semen, which gives them manliness, makes them manly if they do this. That's part of their culture. Uh, part of the culture in India is the very opposite. You don't want to lose any, uh, and you, you want to keep as much sperm as possible. You want to keep as much semen as possible. But of course in the United States, we don't think that uh, one, uh, we don't believe uh, the people, like the people in New Guinea believe, and we don't believe like the people in India believe. But it's cultural. It has to do with semen. If you were around somebody from India, potentially, this would be, everybody knows that. It wouldn't, wouldn't even be, uh, it uh, wouldn't be, even be a question. I can't even talk to you. What's going on with this? It is possible that other cultures suffer from the same psychological disorder as, as the West, but don't have the same cultural beliefs associated with Western diagnoses, making them meaningless in other cultural contexts. So if we look at the DSM-5, there's probably a lot of stuff in there that only, only Western man believes. So if you go to Africa or you go to Asia, you're not going to find exactly the same problems. Uh, so if we, you can't take the DSM-5 and go to Africa and be a mental health care worker. It's not going to work. Some of their problems don't exist. Some of the problems that exist in the DSM-5 do not exist in Africa. Some of the problems that they have, a lot, of, a lot of the times, they think that the problems are caused by witchcraft. We almost have the same kind of um, problem. Ah. Well, there's like um, anything to do with um, semen or sperm. Like if you ejaculate that you were talking about. Hey, he said it. He said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> it's you create an evil being or you create something that, because in our traditional history, our stories, they say where the water crosses, for male and female, the separation of sex. Okay. So when they did that, they created evil beings as they did that onto rocks, onto sticks. Ah, ah, ah. So I, then, I've, I've read that story. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's well, why. Maybe you told it. me that story. Okay. Yeah, I think I wrote it. <laughs> okay. So it's almost a little, little kind of it's, it's, Yeah, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Evil. So you guys don't believe in masturbation either? Yeah, it's uh, when you take um, you create an evil young being. man into sweat lodge. That's where you talk about these kind of things. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. <clears throat> 
So different cultural practices. Let me make sure I'm not going over. Like you guys that let me go over. <laughs> hey, kikamori. Hey, kikamori. I love that word. <laughs> hey, kikamori is a condition in Japan characterized by living in an asocial state with no intimate relationships with anyone outside of the immediate family. Hey, kikamori. Now remember, the Japanese live in a very crowded society. There is no such thing as going off uh, to your ranch and staying there and, and not ever coming in contact with people. Doesn't exist in, in Japan, can exist in Japan. 30% of the island is habitable, which means 70% is inhabitable. So, and there's lots and lots of, of Japanese. So they're, it's really, really, really crowded, okay? Uh, so somebody who tries to isolate themselves is not is incorrect as far as the Japanese are concerned. This first appears in junior high school, and they they end up reading books, watching television, or playing games in their room. God, it sounds like every teenage boy on the reservation, doesn't it? Not the book reading book part, but watching television and playing games on their on their. There you go, Jill. Yeah, exactly. No, Tyrone. Okay. <laughs> Do we have any gamers in here? Any gamers? Like Tyrone, brother. okay. Sounds like my brother. <laughs> that sounds like your brother. <laughs> well, don't let him go to Japan. They'll think he's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> the indications are that the cause may be failure to succeed in a social world that has few options for those who don't fit in. In Japan, if you do not, if you're not like everybody else, then uh, then you are changed. They change you. They force you to change. That's the way it works in Japan. Uh, here, I can wear a bolo tie. Nobody else wears a bolo tie here at this institution, but I can wear one without being socially ostracized, I hope. And maybe I am being socially ostracized. I just don't recognize it. That's a possibility as well. I can be anybody that I want to be in the United States. In Japan, that's not the way it works. If something is popular, if people are, start wearing a select type of clothing, Everybody starts wearing that select type of clothing. I told you they have two colors of car in, the, in uh, Japan. 70% of all cars in Japan are white. 70%. And the ones that aren't white are black. That's Japan. <clears throat> I wouldn't have a black car or a white car, damn it, because I'm not going to let the Japanese tell me what color car I can have. So what color are my cars? Red. Red. <laughs> I know. If I went to Japan, they'd probably shoot me before I got off the plane, as that works. <clears throat> okay, does... Uh... <laughs> uh, okay, so what's happening here? At first, it appears in junior high school. The indications are that they cause... Uh, that the cause may be failure to succeed in a social world that has few options. Okay, we already talked about that. It does not conform to criteria for many DSM-5 diagnoses. This, nothing in the DSM-5 has anything to do with the hikikamori. Uh, it has uh, only recently become a cultural phenomenon and is now seen, although rarely, in other East Asian countries. Uh, so because Jap Japan is so crowded, China, we're seeing the same thing in China. But this is a brand new disease. It's never been identified before. Why? Well, they didn't have television, for one thing. They also didn't have video games. Where do all the video games come from? Japan, of course. And then they make them in China. They're not made in the United States. Nobody, nobody makes games in the United States. It takes too long. Tyrone makes he makes games. <laughs> Approximately one child per classroom in junior high and high school is afflicted with hikikamori. Hik Largely not ex existent in pre-war Japan, and it's com and uh, uncommon in other cultures. This is what it looks like. It looks like hoarding, doesn't it? That's not really hoarding. That's the way you have to live in Japan. Uh, there's no room to put anything, so you kind of pile your your stuff up, but uh, you can see how um, you can see her bed is covered with uh, with uh, plush toys. I know as weird as that is. Yeah. This is something that you never see in Japan, but you do now. All of a sudden, you see it. 
and so they recognize it as a mental illness in Japan. And they know that there's always one in each junior high and high school class. One kid that's a little bit off to the extent that they want stuff that, that other kids don't have. Bulimia nervosa, bulimia is uncontrollable binge eating. Uh, individuals uh, then will take inappropriate measures to prevent weight gain. Uh, so there, there's two aspects to, uh, uh, to bulimia. The first one is that you eat an excessive amount of food. And it's usually food that comes up painless, like cake. Cake is a good Twinkies, uh, Little Debbie's cupcakes. Things that when you vomit it back up, it's not going to, you know, rip a hole in your esophagus. You don't want to eat chips, okay? Chips are too rough, and they'll carve up your esophagus when they come up. Uh, so they eat a lot of soft things. Uh, cake. Uh, cheesecake is, is big because it comes up real, real nice. It comes back up real good. <laughs> uh, Bulimia is absent in most cultures of the world, making it a, a culture-bound syndrome, especially in cultures where food is not abundant. Of course, you wouldn't want to throw things up. You wouldn't want to, hopefully. Eating disorders affect many people in the West, but uh, there are some nuances when it comes to determining universality. There, there are some nuances. Oh. Uh, bulimia appears to be a culture-bound syndrome because rates have de uh, increased over time and the age of people being diagnosed with bulimia has got, gotten lower over the years. We're seeing elementary school girls uh, with bulimia throwing up so they don't get fat. It is also more prevalent in some societies, particularly those with Western influences, than in others. In particular, it is uh, absent in most cultures of the world, especially in cultures where food is not abundant, of course. There is a good evidence that bulimia is a culture-bound syndrome. It's very prevalent in the United States. Uh, it's prevalent, what was I just thinking? It's uh, very common with uh, white people, of course, uh, but it's spreading to the black population, uh, especially slender African-American women, like uh, Nicole Ritchie uh, was, uh, had bulimia, or not, well, she used bulimia, but she was anorexic for a while. <clears throat> she was bulimic before she was anorexic. Uh, so it's very common, especially among very slender people. Uh, if you're kind of, if you're not so slender, you're kind of short and squat, uh, those, those individuals, not very common among Hispanics. Hispanics like a well-rounded woman. What was I reading? It was a story about a lady from, who's Puerto Rican. And her mother kept trying to fatten her up. Every time she went over to her house, she tried to fatten her up. She's on a diet, and every time she went over there, she'd feed her all this fattening food and say, "Honey, you're, you know." She'd grab her breasts and go, "Honey, you need to pump these, pop these things up," you know, that kind of stuff. Because his, Latina women, Latinas, uh, Latina uh, people, uh, they they want to be well-rounded to look like they have fat body fat so that they can reproduce. That's what they were looking for. And she, of course, was trying to, to be slender, go on a diet, vomit, whatever she ate. Funny, funny stuff. Okay, we'll, we'll pick this up next time right here with anorexia nervosa. As much fun as anorexia is. <clears throat> oh, she's hot. Oh.